Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Is it Sean? I know. I know. But there's a lot of steam. Welcome to this evening's October 13th, um, 2015 school board meeting. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone know how the girls have done in soccer tonight? Mm. Okay. I will note that's why our student representatives are not here this Oh, yeah, that's because <laughs> they're so playing soccer. Um, well, we'll wish them well. So um, welcome this evening. Uh, the first item on the agenda is to ask if there are any adjustments to tonight's agenda. Seeing none, item one, done. Um, item two, approval of school board minutes. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the school board minutes from the executive session on September 8th, the regular business meeting on September 8th, and the workshop on September 21st as provided for in our practice. Second. second. Discussion? All those in favor? David, we will get a motion right before we promise. He, he did right. I was just telling me he, he pitched perfect. Excellent. Um, item three, comments by our student representatives. As we've no so noted, they are hopefully doing a great job at soccer tonight. Item four, comments from the public on agenda items. Do we have any comments from the public on agenda items this evening? OK. Item five, communications. Um, 5A, Global Collaboration Day. So Senora Dana is here from the middle school, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the work she and her students and some students in other classes did on that day. Hi. Um, I hadn't planned to present, but I'm just going to talk, and at the same time, I'm trying to get this ready. Um, just some of the things that we did. There we go. Let's see if that works. If it doesn't work, it's not critical. So anyway, uh, Global Collaboration Day this year was on September 17th. It's the first year they've ever offered that. It was arranged by Lucy Gray and Steve Hargnon, um, who are two educators. Um, and actually, I first met Lucy Gray at an Actum conference, which is the main tech conference. I met her probably five or six years ago, so it was a good use of PD money when I went to Actum. Um, and I followed Lucy Gray ever since on Twitter. I get a lot of my professional development, a lot of my ideas from Twitter, and also share a lot of ideas on my Twitter feed with, with other teachers. Um, so this Global Collaboration Day was on Lucy Gray's, it, it's her brain, uh, whatever, her brainstorm. Um, so I signed up, I found out about it, it's the first time ever they've offered this, and it was an opportunity for educators and students to connect all around the world on this one day, September 17th. She had it very well organized, taking into account time zones and everything else, and I think it was our third week of school. So the very first week, I introduced it to students, and you know, are there any ideas, anything that you'd like to do? I started out with five or six ideas that I thought might work. First of all, it was the beginning of the year. I didn't even know my students' names at that point, so I wanted to give them some kind of strict uh, some parameters. But uh, so we decided to uh, submit a, a proposal to present, and we did soundscapes from around the world. Now, obviously, we only have five people here, but. Um, but the idea was that people would record sounds, whether from nature or made by people, um, and post them on this Padlet. I don't know if you're familiar with Padlet, but Alina will also be talking about that. But um, it, it's like a community bulletin board. So it was interesting. Um, I definitely want to pursue this. I've kept this open. I'm going to put it out on my Twitter feed to see if anyone else just wants to add to this. It is difficult. I realize some people might not know how to do an audio recording. They're kind of some things I, I guess I took for granted. So some weren't sure how to do an audio recording or save it as an MP3 and get it from there up onto the Padlet. So there is some tech, technical expertise that, that, um, that we need. But um, so I had my seventh graders and fifth graders um, uh, whatever, participate. Anne-Marie Dion also offered, I think hers was animals around the world after she heard about this. And I tweeted or I sent an email out to the staff and the middle school at least and said, you know, does anyone else want to participate? Even if you don't host a session, you can at least participate. 
But um, in the end, I, there were uh, 325 participating schools, 51 different countries, 37 states, and there are 149 events and projects. Um, and what I had, the seventh graders, we did different things. One thing that was a little bit difficult because it's completely on the fly, which is, I tend to, whatever, we all have our lesson plans. But so at nine o'clock, you could find what events were being offered. So at nine o'clock, my students came in, we were online, and some worked, some didn't. One was a, um, was it? it was a, where was it, right here. It was a global uh, Twitter taboo. If you're familiar with the game of taboo, it's kind of like Pictionary and Charades. So someone, we were actually playing with someone in Morocco, and they would post the question. And then just through my Twitter feed, we would, let me see if I can get to my, here's the Twitter feed. Um, we were responding with the hashtag global ed 15. I'm also using, I've kind of started CEMS Cape, which is just kind of on my, for Cape Middle School, Cape Elizabeth, hashtag. Um, so the first one to get their response back with that hashtag uh, would, would win that particular trivia question. It was kind of hard. Sometimes the connections didn't work, but it was a great idea, and I'm definitely going to pursue that. And my students and I want to come up with a, with a, a trivia question. Um, there were others. We had a slow Twitter chat. There was also a fifth grade global classrooms. So um, let me see. I think this is, I've got too many windows open here. Oh, here it is. Classrooms from around the world. So the idea was for teachers to, let me go to present. Uh, teachers to just post a picture of their students and then why they think global collaboration is interesting. So there are students from, there's Wisconsin, Mexico City, Venezuela, Ghana, Tokyo, Japan, New Zealand, just going through these quickly, just to give you an idea that England, Dallas, Texas, pretty soon it's going to be Cape Elizabeth Middle School, Wisconsin, California, uh, Maryland, is that New Zealand? Um, anyway, so we got the fifth grade classes up here. So there's Mexico, Kazakhstan, Spanish. There we go, Cape Elizabeth Middle School. I, didn't, I wasn't sure of permission to publish at that point, so I had fifth graders draw a picture. Um, so this is what they came up with as a class. We did respond in English, why collaborate? So they're pretty excited to see their, um, whatever, their, their drawing up here. Um, so I think it was great for the very first Global Collaboration Day. And I did ask students what they, it was before they had their iPads, I've got all paper copies, but um, I'll always ask students at the end of a unit or a project what, what worked well, what didn't. So um, just one thing, why, why do they think global collaboration is important? And these are directly from the students. So one said it's important because we can connect to different places around the world, which makes us a stronger world. It's important because the whole world can connect through things they enjoy and have in common. They can also learn about each other's culture, language, and other things about where they live. These are all by my seventh graders, by the way, not the fifth graders. Um, another one, you can connect to people you wouldn't talk to on a normal basis. I thought that was interesting. Did you enjoy participating in Global Collaboration Day? Why or why not? Uh, my favorite part was Skyping different countries. We got to see different classrooms, what they look like, different teaching styles, and how they speak. So depending upon the day, we Skyped with Argentina. Um, we tried another Twitter taboo. There's a global draw where an art teacher gave directions and everyone draw, drew according to the directions and different perspectives. Um, some things were a complete flop. I think period two, nothing worked because the connection died on the Skype, but that's part of the process. Um, one said it was cool. I really liked playing Twitter taboo. I liked it very much, but would have liked it better if we could have understood the people on Skype. From Argentina, they speak very quickly, so seventh grade students found it a little bit tough, but good practice. Um, it was fun because we got to talk to a Spanish class in India. We did connect with an eighth grade class in India, and Spanish was our common language, which is really interesting. Um, and we're still continuing with that. I've been in touch with the teacher there, so we'll continue with that. Um, was there anything that surprised you or something new you learned about our world, our community, or about yourself? That's another one of my questions. Um, it surprised me that so many people were participating, you could see from Twitter. They, a lot of them don't know about the Twitter, the hashtags with Twitter. So we really were communicating very well with 140 characters through Twitter. Uh, it surprised me that, that the best way to communicate with other places and not to learn their language, but have both learn a common language. I think what the student meant was Spanish is not only good for speaking to someone who speaks Spanish, but it, again, it's your intermediary language. Um, I learned that it's fun to, uh, to see and talk to people that are fluent in Spanish, et cetera, et cetera. So a few things that, that didn't work, I mean, the, the Skype connections were hard. It was very difficult with time changes, but, um, but I think it was really invigorating for the students. It was actually probably a good way to start the year because they said, wow, other people actually use Spanish. Um, and it was fun for them to have that, that live connection. Um, 
So we are definitely going to continue with the context that we've made. And the nice thing about this website, even if someone didn't participate, you can go to the website, and there are the 149 schools, all the presentations, everyone's information is there, all the Google Docs, you can get to this. Um, so it's definitely good. It, it's it's um, a good way to still continue to make collaborations. Um, there is, I'll just say one last thing, a global collaboration conference coming up for educators. It's the week of November 16th through the 19th. I'm thinking about maybe presenting a session. I'm not sure. But I'm going to definitely participate. I've already registered for this. But again, it's all free. It's all online. So you can communicate with teachers all around the world. To me, it's just it's so exciting. Um, so anyway, I think I'll leave it at that because I know we've got a long. Uh, but anyway, so it worked well for the first time. Hopefully next year we can have more people on board. And um, one thing our students did say is they're really grateful for the technology that we have. I think they, they didn't realize that. With, you know, they've got one teacher with, with one computer, and um, a, a number of students said that in different classes. So I, I'm appreciative of the connectivity that we have and the technology that we have. I guess that's it. Thank you. Question? Questions? Comments? Just a quick, who was the organizer for this? Um, it was, it's Lucy Gray and, St and Steve Harngdon. They're educators here in the U.S. Oh. And I I believe they're not teaching now. I'm not sure. I think they've, this has morphed into their full-time job. But I know this Global Education Conference, I think this is the sixth year of it for teachers. But this last one on September 17th was the first time they've involved students. This one also, you, there are strands for educators, uh, for educators, but for students, for administrators, for policymakers. It's really interesting. So it's just anyone involved in education. Um, so you could at least just check it out and look at the, what the offerings are. It's really interesting. Thank you for opening the door and yeah. showing our, our students that it's bigger than uh, yellow and maroon. That's, yeah, that's so true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have um, Dr. Perez's presentation on her fellowship in India. So I have a nice view of the mission, vision, and values from here, but I can see the community value <laughs> right at the top of the list. And um, oh, thank you, Kate. But uh, community is what both um, Susan has just spoken about in terms of global collaboration, and Alina's going to speak about her experiences in India as well. And I think, I think as we prepare our students to live in the world, um, that these kinds of opportunities are critical. So um, I'm here before you to talk about um, a wonderful experience I had in May and June of this year <coughs> um, with the support of both the superintendent and the school board. I spent five weeks um, on a fellowship at the Toxi International School in Sikkim, India to further my knowledge of cross-cultural applications of school psychology principles. So I have a brief slideshow here. Um, at more than 6,000 feet elevation, Toxi is truly nestled in the clouds. And while most of our days were shrouded in clouds, we had rare and awe-inspiring glimpses of the massive Mount Kanchenjunga at more than 28,000 feet into the sky. In much the same way, my role um, at Toxi emerged with patience, listening, and with respect for good teaching already being done there. In my first days uh, at Toxi, a veteran teacher shared with me that the only question she had ever been asked by teachers during her entire education was, do you understand? Yes was the only answer she ever gave. No was not acceptable, lest she be berated, shamed, or worse. Uh, for the most part, this aspect of public education in India has not changed. Thus, the idea of students taking charge and asking questions is an entirely new concept in India, one that still causes cultural conflict and behavior issues, which is the reason for my visit. Um, integration of my own children into the school brought uh, great rapport with the teachers, um, to my surprise. Uh, really, it's a cultural value in India, is a parent having well-mannered children. So I was relieved to have passed that test with my children. Um, but seriously, this was, too, a unique aspect of my work, because different from in the United States, where we strive to separate our personal and professional lives. Uh, in India, my role as a mother really strengthened my role as an expert in behavior management. Um, and also, I was seen kind of as a, a bold innovator, as a single mom traveling halfway around the world with my children. I didn't really expect this, but I tried to live up their expectations in this way. Um, bold innovation is really what Toxie's about. Their motto is, your mind is yours to observe. 
a real true commitment to metacognitive learning and ownership for one's own education. Um, an idea felt I could really get behind. Um, and I think a way that Toxie might really be ahead of us here. Um, the major cultural shift and boldness of Toxie comes from a departure from rote skilling and drilling uh, to observing, reflecting, and being an individual, forming opinions, building arguments, and innovating. In fact, written um, reflections are a constant daily part of their learning there. Um, so a plan for my work quickly developed after I arrived. I consulted and observed all the classrooms, um, working with some teachers on plans for specific students. My other major role was to develop and present to teachers seven workshops. These workshops covered adolescent brain, executive functioning, learning profiles, and behavior management. Integrating a diverse array of work from experts including Ross Green and Nancy Rapoport, as well as current neuropsychological research and work on cross-cultural learning. I also adapted these workshops for parents and upper grade students. We had field trips to local sites that Toxy students had not visited, even including a pool where I gave swim lessons. <laughs> not surprisingly, probably. Um, finally, my last role, and perhaps my most important, was to prepare and train the new dean of students to apply this learning with specific students facing challenges. The questions that teachers came to me with were really diverse. They ranged from, um, why do older students feel so comfortable criticizing and laughing at each other's mistakes? Um, how do I control class without uh, introducing fear? What do I do with a student who ignores directions or instruction, even after constant reminders? The attention span of two of my students is really short. So they get bored in class, and they politely listen. How can I help them? How do I help students be disciplined and show self-restraint, a real cultural value there coming through? How can I make students who don't follow less and voice their concerns without making them feel smaller? Or even how do we balance being perhaps too strict versus too friendly when we work with students? Times I felt like a dear Abby, a school psychologist. But overall, my goal was to give away as much knowledge as I could to the teachers so they could solve these problems after I left. I still continue consulting with the Dean of Students on a volunteer basis, and even tomorrow we have a FaceTime meeting. And I must point out that the teachers at Toxie were highly skilled, knowledgeable, and really deeply committed to their profession and their students. Many of them have left their families, boyfriends, parents behind to come work at the school, which is really nestled very far away from other parts of India. It was really their humble, humble and eager interest in learning that made my time there feel less like work and more like enrichment. Before I left for the fellowship, I um, presented to five individual history and social studies classes, as well as the entire seventh grade in Cape Elizabeth. While in India, I organized and shared in seven FaceTime discussions with Cape Elizabeth students and classes, sharing learning and broadening cultural wonder. I assisted Susan Dana in a cross-cultural learning padlet for India, uh, students in India, Sevilla, Spain, and Cape Elizabeth to share musical interests, something the students could really get behind. And finally, I wrote a learning blog where I shared day-to-day -day learning in my fellowship with teachers and students in Cape Elizabeth. So my goals for this coming year, following this experience, um, I really want to continue this unique connection with Toxie by con um, connecting our students. So in January and February, I'm organizing a visit by Toxie students and a teacher um, to come to Cape Elizabeth. They'll stay with host families and go to school for about a month. I'm also trying to connect, um, I'm also connecting with the high school guidance office to offer a gap year teaching opportunity at Taxi, whereby a motivated and self-directed senior could spend anywhere from three to eight months working alongside teachers at Taxi to further their curriculum and learning through innovation and project-based learning. This gap year experience would be very unique in its self-directedness, its location, and very low cost, a true value. I believe strongly in the value of promoting these experiences for our students, um, especially as we fulfill our mission of valuing the connections among school, local, and global communities in a way that really fosters meaningful participation in, our, in a diverse world, just as our mission states. So thank you, school board, um, for having the vision to allow me to really build this amazing experience and professional learning opportunity. I've grown in my presentation skills, confidence as a behaviorist, and in my first-hand knowledge of systems change. Each of these skills that I believe is really crit critical to my job here in Cape Elizabeth, and I relish the challenge of innovating in our schools through more project-based learning and more cross-cultural experiences for our students. So thank you. Any questions or comments for Elena? 
I'm just so happy that you got a chance to do it and that you took the opportunity. I know life over here is so busy and you can fill every day, mothering, working, volunteering, being a community member, and you do that. And so to take the time out and to really take a risk, um, I, I just can't thank you enough. Um, if you do nothing more with it, even this presentation, what you've already done is huge for Cape Elizabeth, but I can see you're going forward, which, um, you know, thank you for continuing on. Thank you. No, I'm definitely going to do more with it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. It was life-changing, and it was scary at times. But. That mega cognitive stuff is, um, I love that. I, I hope, I don't know if everybody knows that, you know, the, what Wayne Fleet says, learn to learn. You know, it's the big picture thinking, and that's the work you're doing. So thank thinking you Thinking about much. our own thinking and our own learning. Yeah, so, yeah, and I'd love to see our students have more opportunity to do that, to really shape their own educational experience. So, yeah. thank you. I, I, I love that school's mission, your mind is yours to observe. Um, how, what, what sort of impact do you think that your experience had that, that that will translate directly into your work here. Do you, do you, do you feel that your, your work here will change as a result? I think it already has, yeah. Because of the time I spent there, when I first arrived, they were just coming with questions and problems and questions and problems. And I felt overwhelmed because my job here is not really so much in the classroom consulting with teachers. It's much more doing evaluations. But this year, both that experience I had, which I had way back in my training, but it's never something I've been called upon to do, as well as having a second colleague alongside me full time, now frees me up to do more of that work in the classroom. So I feel much more confident in doing that and guiding teachers and having very quick command of the principals and, and being able to handle the overwhelming feelings that teachers often come to you with when they're struggling with these kinds of issues. Oftentimes, teachers do have a lot of good ideas of what to do and how to do it, but they feel overwhelmed with the emotions of it. So it, for me, it really has strengthened my professional um, skills in that way. So I think that's probably the most direct impact, but secondarily, I really hope to continue to um, foster not only the risk-taking um, and thinking about our, how students direct their own education, but also working with other staff members to have more cross-cultural experiences for our students. I think that's really critical. It's too easy to get stuck in this narrow path we we have and this myopic idea of what success is. So um, it was an incredibly freeing experience in that way to see how big the world was and how, how much success and self-satisfaction you can feel outside of Elizabeth. <laughs> so it was really amazing that way. Thank you and th thanks for um, having the courage to bring your idea forward to us. I know you, you came more than once to the board last year and, and, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, it's great to, to learn something about the experience that you had. Thank you. Well, I hope to bring some Indian students to visit too, so I'll bring them here to say hello. Fantastic. Right, Looking forward you. to that. <laughs> Any you. other questions or comments? Okay, really good observation, Meredith. So, um, adjustments to tonight's agenda, actually, if it's okay with um, Mary Page and, and Gwyneth, maybe we should move on to item 6A first. So, first, may I have a motion? Sure. Um, I move we consider to approve Mary Page and Allison Gwyneth's proposal, proposed student trip to Cuba during school spring break, April 16th, 2017. May I have a second? Second. So if you would like to come forward and tell us about your intriguing Cuba. <laughs> Mary Page and Ali Gwither here from the high school along with several students who are very supportive of, the, of this trip and who I think helped get the ball rolling. Yes, so um, we have a few students, Zodi, Kinnan, and Haiti are going to hand out some important pieces of paper you might want. Uh, basically, we, this tour came about as I was having a conversation with Zodi and another student who's not present on uh, a, a bus trip back from a mock trial competition, and I expressed my desire to go for professional development to Cuba, and the kids go, why can't we go too? And I thought, well, why can't we go? This was before, it was the day before the United States eased the relations. We didn't know it until we heard it the next morning. 
And so we started pursuing the trip, looking into assorted tour companies. But let me back up by stating this tour really does tie into our mission, vision, and value statement in an extraordinary way. Um, in terms of academics, we value rich and varied learning experiences. Anytime students have the chance to be on site in a, 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 an authentic location, working uh, with Cuban students, meeting with Cuban entrepreneurs, meeting with Cuban farmers, it's going to be a great learning experience. So yes, I know that right now the Cuban officials do, um, they have the people they bring out to speak to the students do have to toe the party line, but still they will have an, a chance to ask questions. There's a round table discussion, um, a lot of discussions. And the reason we chose this trip as well, some of the trips are all about music and art and museums and let's have a barbecue on the beach. This one is a little more, it's a lot more academic, frankly. We'll tour three cities. We will meet with doctors. We will go visit healthcare facilities. Cuba is renowned for its healthcare uh, treatment, its, its um, facilities and doctors. Uh, we will visit the Bay of Pigs. We will have a roundtable discussion about Cuba-US relations. So we're excited about that component. And there is some fun as well. So it ties to community. We're going to connect with other students in Cuba, hopefully high school students. It's possible in the future that we can lay the groundwork for a more direct exchange of some students going to a Cuban high school for a short period of time and Cuban students coming here. That is something that is happening now. And then finally, passion. We value personal investment in learning in an environment that nourishes joy and creativity. And I can think of no better environment that's going to nourish joy and creativity. Um, and speaking of collaboration, it is a collaborative effort between the Social Studies Department and the Foreign Languages Department. Our chairs are not here tonight, but they're very supportive, as is Principal Shet. So we're very excited going forward. I have the, on my board and on Allie's board a list of about 18 students. We haven't publicized this at all who claim just through word of mouth they want to come, they want to know more. And we already have had a bake sale organized by Katie that has raised $100. This is a trip the students pay for but uh, we hope to offset the cost through some fundraising activity, so it's something that everyone can afford. Finally, the tour operator is not EFI. Uh, Lisa Melanson generally uses EFI when she takes kids on uh, students on tours. This group is called World Strides. It's been in the business for over 50 years. This upcoming year, this year right now, will be the first year it is taking a student group to Cuba. And I've been connecting with that student group and that teacher. It's a very similar school to Cape Elizabeth. It's Hamilton Wenham Regional High School in Massachusetts. Very similar demographics to Cape. So the students are going to pass out just so you have them for your own keeping, itineraries, um, of an insurance policy. We are very insured through World Strides, and yet another document. And that's it. Ellie, do you have anything to add, or will we just open it up for questions? Thanks. Sorry. And we have a wealth of packets from World Strides. I'm just handing out those that I think are essential. If you want any more information, we have it. And I didn't come with the PowerPoint. We've got a bang-up PowerPoint with music, too. Uh, but <laughs> we thought we'd hold on. Only one for night. night. Yeah. We'll wait. It's our limit. We'll do it when we come back. Yeah. Awesome. Any yeah. questions? Who is the trip open to? All grades or? Um, not, we were thinking about not having freshmen. So sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And that fits uh, much better with the curriculum from the history department where we're teaching. In, uh, during sophomore year, we're teaching economic systems. This is a great opportunity to see communism, socialism, capitalism all starting to you know, change and transition, as well as the Cold War. So those students are exposed to this from sophomore year junior year and senior year, whereas the freshman students really haven't learned economic systems. Uh, they're beginning uh, more of their exploration of Spanish, although it's open to any uh, student studying any foreign language. So that would be the one thought we had about who can go and who cannot go. Oh. The, the, the max number of kids that could go? We are lucky. Um, we feel uh, what World Strides does is for every six students, we get a free teacher. So we can, you know, if we have 18 students, we have three teachers. We have teachers that would love to go on this. They're approaching us now. I have adult volunteers from the community who say, hey, if you need a chaperone, I'm on board. Uh, we are aware that there should be a male chaperone, and we have plenty of volunteers for that when we get to that point. So, so you won't have to be selecting students? Should be no, we, we don't. We should not have to get to that point.
So, sorry. Um, this is probably just the mother hat in me, but um, when I was in high school, I went to Germany the first year the wall came down, and it was pretty emotional. Uh, there was still that conflict going on. So I'm, I'm assuming that, I know you all have social emotional training, psychological training, support for when um, we get into a world, an environment that is different than ours and controversial. Um, I just want to bring that up that there will be some train or some conversation about that. That yes, we will as we get closer. Meet with students, meet with parents, and I think that's important because depending on how open the Cuban people can become, there could be some, I don't want to call them altercations, but heated discussions about, look what you did to my country, exactly. whatever. And so that we would prepare the students for that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, because, you know, right now we're capable people, but we're going to a new environment that is a different right, no, culture. Good point, good point. I just had one other question. What, what do you hope to get the students' cost down to with the fundraising? Um, on the itinerary, it shows if and we want, one of the reasons we're going forward is we want to get this, uh, a parent meeting going sometime this fall. Uh, in the ideal world, students will pay, they pay about 3200 but that's if they start signing up this fall and they make monthly payments. They don't have to pay 3200 right away. I would hope through fundraising we can get the cost down to maybe 2700 2600 So I, I think it's too ambitious to hope to really get it down to 1000 but if you can get even cut off several hundred from each student's cost, I think that that helps. Um, the more we can be helpful to all families, I really appreciate that. And World Strides does offer what they call a scholarship program. I haven't looked into it. I think in Cape Elizabeth, um, even someone who feels, I, I don't think they'd qualify for their scholarship program, but it is a possibility. It's also possible through fundraising that we could set some funds aside uh, for a student that really would like to go and just says, there's no way my parents are going to do this, that we can perhaps have our own quiet little scholarship. It's difficult to find a place on earth, I think, uh, aside from Cuba, that, that, has, that is both as safe for a trip like this um, and introduces students to, a, a, you know, as different a perspective on the United States as you, you can get anywhere. Um, the, the opportunity is just tremendous. Uh, the, 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 I think the dialogue that um, travel to Cuba in, it will inspire um, among your students and with uh, between your students and Cuban students um, is you know it's just it, it's it's a tremendous opportunity. We think so too, and we think as the students come back, students will share their learning as well, especially in the classes where there is um, learning about the Cold War, about the Bay of Pigs, about the economic systems. That'll be a great sharing of information, even. But I, and I think Kate, Kate, Kate's point is. In, is important. I mean, this is a this is a regime that you know has billboards up that say that the, the blockade is genocide. Right. Um, you know, and so the 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 you know as as um, important an opportunity it is. You know, an, an interesting and intellectual opportunity it is. It, it I think Kate's right. It's a you know it's a it's a it's a for you know kids who've grown up in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. It's a really different perspective on on the impact of the the you know the the global power of, of the United States um, and its ability to, to affect lives in, in, you know, around the world. So. Sure, and I think it's a, it's a good study on perceptions and on um, a world view, a point of view. So um, I know in World II, I do prepare, I use Cuba as a lens I have for a long time because there are several uh, residents of Cape Brian Sisselman is one and Janine Carey who have traveled to Cuba on a semi-regular basis and they've come in and we've looked at um, Brian Sisselman created a film that has a great portrayal of these darling little Cuban girls singing about there it's a beautiful poem and acting job about how the Americans came and killed us and they put blood on my red shoes or on my white shoes and they did this and this and the students like oh my god you know but they're trained at a young age that this is what Americans have done to us so I think it would also be an opportunity for our students to open other students' minds and other students' ideas. Um, they have the innate ability to share who they are in ways that we can't do it. Um, and I think it will be a, a tremendous growth, both for the Cuban students and our students, especially those that are studying Spanish. They'll find it's an amazing thing to actually have to communicate in the language and not only do it in the four walls that we're in, 
Um, so I think I, I understand, and, and being a foreigner, I understand the idea of perspective. I always thought that people in the United States were tall and wore cowboy hats and drove big cars with horns on the front. I saw a lot of <laughs> Dallas. Um, I grew up on that. Um, yeah, well, um, but I, but I also think that when you when you start coming into um, contact with people that have always seen the things one way and you say, well, this is how, how I see it, there, there's a dialogue that begins um, between these kids that is, could be life-changing for both sides. And I think your point is well taken, Ali, that those misconceptions occur on both sides. Yeah. yeah. Students, any parting thoughts? We're really excited. <laughs> <laughs> so my point of clarity and why I was sort of rummaging through my papers was I noticed there isn't a field trip authorization form in front of us. So tonight you're asking the board to approve the ability to go forward right. to put this trip together and right. then you'll come back to us at another time exactly. to approve the trip itself. Yes. I just wanted to clarify. Right. We, we didn't want to move forward assuming it would be, and then all of a sudden we put the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken, yeah, whatever. Right. So. Right. And that has been typical of our process for these high-cost trips that the planning for those starts a couple of years ahead so that students have the opportunity to defray the costs so that we can build consensus around mm -hmm. offering the trip. I'll put a plug in for wellness as you do fundraising. Let's look at wellness policy and see if we can do it with lim limited sugar. Uh, gluten free. No other, uh, let's look at, I'll help you. I'm happy to help you do fundraising on other hacky sacks or jump whatever, ropes. jump ropes, other things besides. Yeah. Right. yeah. I'm in that one. Yeah. Good point. So. Take charge. Okay. Thank you. Any other dance comments? I, I guess I'm just I'm, I was just realizing it's for 2017. So when you say you're going to um, not include freshmen, do you mean this year's freshmen or for in 2017 uh, we would uh, think that the freshman group that year would, might be a bit too young for the trip. Okay, all right. So, so yeah, next year's right incoming. Now. Next right. year's incoming right. ninth graders would not be eligible. Current ninth right. graders would be yes. would be eligible. Okay. okay. Is, is that your uh, your child? Yes, that's yeah. my child. <laughs> <laughs> we can discuss that. <laughs> I mean, no, he's, he's a ninth grader now. He's a ninth grader now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank Any you. other questions before we have a vote? All those in favor? Six. Six. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, anyone else reading in the audience that we should probably reconsider that? It looks good. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program, item 5D, the superintendent's report. Or 5C, administrator's strategic plan update. I've already checked it off. Yeah. <laughs> you probably wouldn't mind, but you're not off the hook because we have a very observant crew up here. Hi, Michael. Good evening. Good evening. So tonight, just as a reminder to the board, the administrators are going to be speaking primarily about climate and culture work occurring in their buildings focused on that goal of the strategic plan. Oh, and may I make a quick announcement? The girls' soccer team did win 3-0. Yes. Excellent. So exciting. So at the middle school, around uh, goal two of our strategic plan to expand learning opportunities for all students by cultivating an inclusive and supportive district culture, um, I believe I had shared with you a little bit earlier, but it's worth mentioning again, we had one of our opening sessions with our staff, with uh, Mr. Steve Wessler, uh, talking again with us about how to empower students to stand up and speak up, um, at the same time giving our staff strategies for what to do when they're encountered by issues or hearing students uh, engaging in issues that involve bias, harassment, degrading language, teasing, or bullying. And I think a very important and powerful message that our staff took away from that was even if it's not a perfect response, um, it's better to do and say something rather than do nothing. And I think that was very liberating for the staff and gave them a lot of permission to 
at least show um, that uh, silence uh, would indicate acceptance, so at least saying something, um, even if it doesn't come out perfectly, they felt very good about. So moving forward, they're very feeling very much more prepared to, to do something, uh, and they, they intended to do so. Um, we had a very positive start uh, and tone to our, to our year. Um, and I would say despite our survey data from, from June, um, um, particularly in the area of the staff climate and culture survey where um, uh, we have some very concerning data points there that we're um, looking very carefully and closely at and we're very concerned about, myself included. Um, at the same time, many staff members at the beginning of this year are reporting um, even though having seen the survey data, feeling like we're already in a very different place and we're trying to reconcile why that is and what, what might be happening. And so um, we're engaged in a lot of meaningful dialogue and a lot of thoughtful um, responses to where we are as, as a middle school um, staff in terms of our climate and culture, at the same time making sure we're looking at um, how students are doing in terms of climate and culture and also how parents are feeling having their students at our school and how welcome they feel in our school. So, uh, you know, again, a very positive start and a positive tone while at the same time acknowledging we, we have some work to do and we're committed to, to doing that. Um, our team leaders um, started the year on that note, um, initiating a Friday, every Friday snack uh, program for our, for our staff. So a team has stepped up and decided just to do a little morale building and, and a little bit of a boost. So we have a team each, each Friday morning um, and invented some pretty funny names for, for each team to, to, to do that. Um, we instituted a Cake Wednesday, one time per month. We come together in our LLC for 20 minutes and eat cake, and we're not allowed to talk shop. It's 51% right. whole wheat cake. Correct, 51. <laughs> we that just out. tipped the scales. This is, Without this is, frosting. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a little off the record uh, cake Wednesday. That's okay, so, yeah. I'll bring the aguave. <laughs> yeah. um, um, we, and I've uh, just began holding monthly meetings with our CEA new building reps, which we, we had done uh, uh, last year, but we had a new, a new building rep this year, so we, we committed to doing that. So just, just some kind of not only symbolic, but also some, some steps that help uh, to improve how people are feeling about their teaching and learning environment, so, so it's helping. Um, in regards to the survey, I know you've seen it, um, and I mentioned it's concerning um, in, in a lot of ways, in particular areas, but um, you know how satisfied staff are at working um, at our school or department and talking about the people they work with, how much they trust and respect each other, whether they feel safe at work, whether they how how well they would say they care about each other on a personal level um, have all very troubling data points and um, we're really rolling up our sleeves and having some very frank conversations about why that is and what we can we can do about it. Um, we, uh, I decided to um, reach out to Meredith and with her support and which I understand is with your support as well. Um, Doug Purley and I um, engaged uh, with uh, Adriana Belleros from Belleros Associates um, to come and work with us and help us unpack these culture and climate issues. Adriana is the same consultant that did some work with our DLT group and helped us with our uh, leadership retreat this summer. Um, she's um, very talented, very effective. I think um, our leadership team is already better for the, for the work that she's done. Um, Adriana came in and met with our whole staff at the end of September at a staff meeting, introduced herself, talked about her experiences working with organizations of all kinds, and she discussed a process that she was willing to take us through if our staff found it uh, acceptable and if it met our needs uh, very much into customizing and tailoring what she would do based on what we felt we needed. So it was a very open meeting and a chance for us to give input, ask lots of questions of her, and to give suggestions about what we thought we needed and what we could use some, some help with. Um, she is committed to meeting with every staff member who would like to, uh, it's open and optional, um, to do an individual interview. So she's going to be with us for six full days between now and mid-November to do uh, a 30 to 45 minute interview with each, each person. 
to plan to meet with us uh, December 7th, and she's going to discuss and just share back some overall themes about what she's hearing um, to lead to our uh, January 15th Professional Development Day, where we'll do some additional work, uh, not only unpacking our, our climate culture survey, but the recent results of her, her interview process. Um, so uh, I'm feeling very confident and hopeful that we've had a very positive start and through this work that we're going to do with Adriana that we're, we're really going to be riding the ship and, and turning things around um, for, for all of us. And I'm hearing from everyone all the way from the principal through every staff member. We're all committed to, to doing this and making the middle school in a better place. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, we had a very positive um, professional development day last Friday. We spent the morning having some text-based discussions around professional learning communities, uh, competency-based reporting, differentiated instruction. I did an exit ticket and survey, and the, and the staff thought it was fabulous, enjoyed the time getting to connect and to have um, really meaningful conversations with mixed groups uh, of middle school staff and um, they, they were very positive about that experience. Um, with focusing on students, um, we are going to have two rounds of our Stand Up Speak Up training um, with our now trained trainers with, who trained with Steve Wesser last year. So we'll have two sessions, one in the fall and one in the spring, um, where we'll do 80 students per session. So we'll have another 160 students who are trained in the Stand Up Speak Up training um, by the end of this year. Um, our student engagement and satisfaction survey from last winter, uh, we're, we're looking at that data and talking about that as well. We had 82% of our students report that they feel safe at school. Um, we have 79% saying they're satisfied with the overall quality. 69% um, saying they feel connected and supported by at least one adult at school. Um, if you'll remember on our indicators of success, our goal is 90%. Um, so as of last winter, we had 69% of our students reporting that they feel connected and supported by at least one adult. So there's definitely an area we can do better, and our goal speaks to, to doing better, and we will. Um, it is unusual to hear derogatory or intolerant language at my school. 31% um, of, uh, of students said that, that reported that unfavorably. 33% were neutral. 36% reported favor favorably. So if we just went from favorable, we need to get from a 36% to an 85% on our indicators of success. So that stand up, speak up training and our staff's commitment to to responding and doing something uh, needs to help us move from that 36 to towards that 85. So we still have that, that work to do. 22% um, have an unfavorable report that bullying is not a problem at my school. Um, that does mean 78% is in the more favorable side, but um, 50, with 52% of our students saying bullying is not um, a problem at my school, is a problem <laughs> at our school, so we need to, to do better. And again, that, that Wessler work um, is committed to, to helping with that. It is the second year of our advisory block and our master schedule, so these are the kinds of issues we look at and talk about during advisory. Our civil rights team is up and running for the second year, as is our peer helpers program. Um, we're coordinating with John Holdridge and the high school to have high school mentors coming to the middle school to work with our students. Um, our student council has already been very active. Um, in fact, for the first time since I've been there, we had four council representatives come to me um, who are also, some of them are members of the district's innovation team, and they requested to attend a team leader meeting today so they could address staff leaders about some things that they wanted to talk about and initiate for consideration by the staff for some school-wide ideas. And they were very impressive, very well-spoken, very forward-thinking group of students who um, did an amazing presentation of some things that they kindly asked if the team leaders would think about and discuss with the rest of the staff and to, to get back to them about, about some of those ideas. So all about promoting the student voice and the leadership and to see a staff leadership group come together with a student leadership group and have an open discussion and dialogue was pretty pretty amazing and, and pretty neat so those are just some of the some of the highlights I wanted to mention I'll stop there and I'll see if you have questions uh, in terms of the, that metric around 
when you ask students whether they have one member of the staff who, who I can't remember what the question is exactly, knows them well. Um, who they can turn to. Who they, who they can turn to, who they can trust, or who knows them well. Um, what, what are the climate consultants uh, advising teachers and staff in terms of steps that they can take to change that you know, to improve that, that metric specifically. So if I'm a teacher and I come into your office and I say, look, you know, I'm working really hard and I'm, mm. and I'm kind to my students, you know, but I want, I want to help, you know, improve this metric. How, how can I, what can I do? Um, they'd say probably three things, relationships, relationships, relationships. Greet your students at the door, look them in the eye, use their name, how are you doing? being in the hallway, being present, greeting, and all that, so they, they know we're watching, we know who they are. I noticed you were absent yesterday, let me know if you need some help catching up. Oh, they noticed I wasn't here at school. All of that is that, that you're known, you're noticed, you have a voice, you're, re, you're respected. Um, the, exp the learning experience in your classroom needs to, and the curriculum being offered, has to be respectful. So is this appropriately challenged for me? Did I have a voice in forming and shaping what happens for me uh, over the course of my day, week, and year in the classroom? Uh, all of those things uh, for students to feel invested in a part of what, what happens to them uh, at school and, and in classrooms. It, it doesn't mean students can do whatever they want or that, uh, you know, it's just that kind of a, an open range uh, learning, but it's, it's really um, shifting from a you know, uh, from a adult-directed environment to really a student-centered environment, um, just to, as some ways. And then, you know, you do things like the the advisory programming, where you have small groups of students connecting and having ongoing dialogue with one adult. So you're creating a a, a relationship there that's that's ongoing. Um, we have we have two school counselors and a social worker at our building who can help teachers in supporting students in that way and can support students directly in that way. So it, it's a lot of things, but you can go from a very specific classroom level to relationship building in the classroom to the teaching and learning experiences to all of the support wraparound services you have throughout a school and community. I, I think it all has to work in, in connection. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm like, I think that, I mean, I'm only guessing it was discouraging for you to see the results that we read, and I just want to say that you've made really overt steps to take that on, to, to open communication, to really invite uh, an, a better understanding of what would improve culture in middle school, and I just think it's really commendable. I thank you for sharing all of that. Thank you. Quickly, I received an email over the long weekend from a parent um, who had read an interview account with a student who's currently at the high school, um, who shared in this interview her experiences as a middle schooler um, in, in sort of being singled out because she started wearing a hijab when she was in middle school and um, was subjected to some of that intolerant and derogatory language. And as Ali and Mary were speaking about earlier, some of the misconceptions that I think we still carry, you know, here in our maroon and yellow yes. um, Cape Elizabeth community where we have some, in some cases, less inter interaction with and an understanding of the world that is shaped by our own experiences. Um, and I was so pleased to be able to say to her, we're on it. Um, and I, I think that's true at both the middle school and the high school, that the work that we have done with Steve Wessler over the last couple of years, the growth of the Stand Up Speak Up teams, the staff responsive staff response training that has gone on as well really is empowering to that student and all the students who will follow her um, through our schools and in, in helping them know that they do matter that they do have a voice that that they can speak up and that there will be support for them so thank you both of you for that work Great. thank you for sharing that i just have to say i'm sorry that I'm in a carpool with uh, all these seventh grade boys from a couple from Cape and a couple from other towns and the comment they other kids were using gay and retarded in their conversation and the Cape student said stop saying that you know and it's just that one voice to, to spread out uh, don't say that and then of course the parents heard it and spread it through the team that we support kids saying stop can you stop saying that in a very kind and patient way so 
Thank you for doing that work. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you all for your help. Thank you. Even though I still have administrator strategic plan updates checked off, there's still two more people who are not updated. It's interesting when you're listening in the comments. <laughs> Some of what I have to say is, as you can imagine from that last conversation, is ditto from Steve, uh, from Mike. <laughs> it's been a while since Steve's been here. From Mike, uh, because we're, we've sort of the, the Wessler training is sort of a joint journey at both schools. Um, Steve Wessler will be, because we had one last day because of our NIASC work at the beginning of the year, I couldn't get Steve Wessler in to see the faculty the begin before school began, but. Um, we are exploring um, three possible days between now and the end of the school year to have him come in and do the same work that he did with the middle school faculty, with our faculty before the end of the year. Um, our plan also is uh, to do a train one training with, uh, again, approximately 80 kids in the fall and approximately 80 kids in the, in the spring. Um, so we're really excited about that work, I would say. Another significant um, effort that we've been making is, is to improve our ninth grade transition services. Um, so those have changed notably in two ways. First of all, for all ninth graders, um, as we have for the last few years, those students have been assigned in what's called an upper link, who is part of our Fresh Links program. Uh, but this year, under the leadership of Nate Carpenter and Tom Cohan, and with the support of a grant from the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, um, we, they were able to do a tremendous amount of planning, um, gathering information from ninth graders before they came here, trying to do a much more careful job of matching students up, uh, the older students and the younger students, and planning a series of activities um, much more comprehensively than we have had in the past, and there are still activities to come between now and midterms. Um, the most intense time was the first few weeks of the school year, um, and I do know that Nate just last week started calling sort of randomly some parents of ninth graders to sort of get a sense of how things appear to be from their perspective, and so far has gotten uh, very positive reviews. Um, Nate and Tom Cohan and Ben Raymond from our Special Services Department are also collaborating. This is also with the support of the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation with a pilot program which we call Freshman Academy, uh, which is a class uh, for a small group of students um, to really support their transition to high school, um, both academically, socially, emotionally, organizationally, and in other ways, um, and I think the experience of the, the perspective, the teacher's perspective is that things are going well, um, and there's and, and and I think I think the feedback that they're getting from the kids is really positive as well. They've invited the parents of those kids to all come to an evening. I think it's the night before our our uh, parent-teacher conferences, I believe, to sort of get parents' perspective more universally on how that's going. Uh, but we've been really pleased with that so far. Um, we did um, start our flash chat series, which we started last year, sort of bringing speakers in from the community to talk to our kids and hopefully inspire our kids. Um, our first flash, flash chat speaker was a gentleman who uh, is a recent graduate from Bowdoin. He's 24 years old. Um, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I forget which African country that he works in. Do you remember? Um, no, I he's, he's organized a, uh, uh, he was inspired during, in, a, in an experience between his freshman and sophomore years at Bowdoin uh, to work in and create what is now a philanthropic organization um, which seeks to spread basic medical care to students um, through school systems. So to sort of forge a partnership between um, school systems and medical caregivers. And so that was a really, really, really neat story. Um, I will say that uh, I <coughs> was talking to Jonna Friedman today, who's one of our senior students, who about a year and a half ago um, asked me in a passing conversation whether I would support the idea of creating a photo blog to sort of 
emphasize the diversity that there is, although we are not a diverse school in a lot of ways compared to other places, but there is more diversity than many people might recognize. So um, she did um, start a photo blog. I had forgotten that we had talked about it, honestly, until I got a call from a reporter this past weekend. And, um, John, John and I uh, met today just to sort of iron out some details in terms of confidentiality and some other things, but it's a really kind of a neat um, entrepreneurial endeavor that she and several other students are sort of spearheading. Um, we did have our first school dance this year. I'm sorry to say I can't report firsthand how it went because I, I delegated it to Nate and uh, Abel Crew um, and gave my daughter a break from my presence. Um, I'll be back um, later in the year at school dances. My understanding is that it was a positive experience. Oh, and Heaven the superintendent there. was there. I will there. say. The superintendent was there as well. And it was interesting. I've, I've been doing this long enough that um, when Nate reported to me that there were, there were some, that the only issues that came up were some sophomore boys sort of doing something that vaguely sounded like a mosh pit activity. Um, that we used to deal with about 15 years ago and honestly after some of the things we've dealt with in recent years about dances that sounded like a welcome relief to me. I'm, <laughs> I'm all over mosh pits, I can deal with it. <laughs> but I wasn't there that day so thank you Meredith and the other folks who were there. Um, and we have not yet as a faculty started to look at the climate and culture survey results. It was something that was tentatively on the agenda for this past Friday, but it, 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 um, didn't, uh, it didn't make the final cut. We will take a look at that as a staff. Um, the student engagement surveys, I, I don't remember as comprehensively and as detailed a way as Mike does um, sort of the results. I do remember to me the one that I am really the most passionate about in all those numbers is the one, one of the ones that Mike emphasized, which uh, which is, do students have a sense that they have a significant adult in their lives who knows and supports them? And my recollection is that traditionally the high school has been between about 75 to 80 percent, depending on different surveys, and it was about the same this past year as well. So it was not a, it was not a huge breakthrough year, despite the uh, the work with the advisory group. I am not discouraged by that. I think we went into it understanding that it's it's sort of a long-term process and it's a process of getting teachers comfortable with their roles, students understanding sort of what the purpose is. We did do a survey of students at the end of the year to get a sense from them more directly in a less standardized survey sort of what their experience was in the advisory group and the vast majority had very positive comments to make. Um, there were some that indicated that basically were a reflection of the fact that some teachers are, are still have, it's, it's, a, it's a different role that they're, they're sort of stepping into and adopting and um, we will continue to work on that and I think the longer the teachers are doing it, the more they find. That high school teachers tend to be very, as a group, very lesson plan driven and, and, and for the, and some are. And a lot of them are very comfortable just sitting down and having an informal conversation about something they read in the newspaper or some issue around school. Um, and I t think it's taken some, a little bit of, to get some to step back from the idea that there must be an organized activity every day. Um, so I think we're moving towards the more informal, the more real, the more authentic. And um, I think a lot of teachers are there now, but there is, it's still a growth process to do as we work our way into the advisory program. I have a quick question. So on the advisory program, that yes. saying, what would be your ideal advisory period? Like, what's the goal for yep. student and teacher interaction during these periods? The goal, uh, to quote from a famous middle school principal is relationships, relationships, and relationships. <laughs> <laughs> that is really what it's about, and it's not about anything else. Um, in fact, when we started the journey through the advisory program, one of the things that we said very explicitly to teachers is that our sense is that most of the kids in Cape Elizabeth have more than enough people looking over their shoulders in terms of their academic performance. Um, and really the effort is not, to, it's not a, a academic monitoring performance. There is certainly room for that to the extent kids might bring up issues related to that, but that's not a primary goal. The primary goal is to build that relationship between the adult and the students and to build a, a relationship among the students 
um, so, that the, so that their connections are broad and that so that within the school they have a sense that if, if um, there's something they need to talk to somebody about, that there's somebody that they're comfortable going to talk to that person about. Um, you shared in the last spring a great anecdote along those lines of a student in your advisory who right. sort of came with this dilemma and put it out and got incredible response from peers in a way that you really hadn't anticipated might happen um, in this process. And I think that speaks to the, the role an advisory can play in connecting students with one another and helping them find their voice and feel that they're not alone um, in the trials and tribulations that they face as high school students. And, I, and I've heard any number of anecdotes about that from different advisors. Um, and that is really what the advisory program is intended to be about. Fantastic. Any other questions? Um, the more that we can tell parents about this is great. Um, because when parents come, oh, you had Jeff Shedd as your advisor, you must be getting so much information from him. So how we can help the kids by sandwiching, you know, I'm all set, mom, I'm doing advisory, you know, my son comes home and says, I love my advisor, she's the coolest, and I have to go, but did you talk about this, this, and this? And he's like, you know, gives me the message, chill, I can go in and see her, and, um, you know, so I need that message, and I get to hear it because I'm with you guys every two weeks, but, um, other parents don't get to hear it so much, so I don't know how we can help the kids and help advisory go better by giving us parents permission to let it go. Let it go. Oh. Chill. Right. Right. Okay. That's that's a good, very good perspective. Thanks. Any other questions for Jeff? Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least. Good evening. I will be brief um, since Joe's already checked us off, so I will. Um, I, it's, I'm good to that. <laughs> so, um, so, climate and culture at Pond Cove just skyrocketed on Monday when we um, had the announcement of Talia Edlin being the main teacher of the year. And um, thank you to those of you who could make it under the roost that Meredith and I planned. And we had several people question us, like, what, uh, why are up? What's this confluence of problems, and um, Michael's not here tonight, but he said, I just don't understand the refrigeration system. We just built, put in a new one, and what happened to it? And I'm on the facility. He was taking complete um, blame for, um, so it was, but it was just really raised the roof, as you can imagine. And so for those of you that we were able to make it, um, it, you know, you, you felt that, but, you know, I think it's reverberated across the community. Tali says she walked in the, to the local, place the other day and they said, oh, I know you. And she said, no one's ever said they know me. And so I said, they do now. And so her picture is plastered all over the pages. And so we're so proud of her. But we're so proud of everybody because we really feel, I think I've mentioned, she's emblematic of the great teaching that is going on at um, CAPE. And we think she's going to be a fantastic ambassador around the state um, for, for, for everyone. So and around the country because she's got some traveling that she's going to do around the country. So for culture and climate, the work that we're moving forward on, I've mentioned in the past, we have silent mentors. And so we've done our silent mentor activity where we the, um, teachers list every student in their class. And we go around and check off, who do you know? And then we look for pockets. What are the gaps? And who seems to be slipping through? Who, does, who don't we know? And we know we have a lot of new, new students this year, so we that um, we were very proactive about that. Brie Gallagher invited um, families in um, at, for an open house, but not just for an open house. She also invited them to make personal appointments if they wanted to learn more, and if she, if they felt she, and we as a school needed to learn more about them as a family and their children. So we want to start doing that annually, and um, even just for the high school um, on Friday, the. Um, in the afternoon, the ed camp sessions. I attended um, several that had to do, well, several, I attended three, but it seemed like the theme was, um, a lot of it was around anxiety, and anxiety that was coming from kids. And um, Nate Carpenter and I were in one, and we 
afterwards we got talking about collaborating with um, one of the um, programs that Jeff was talking about, um, not, not the Freshman Academy, but um, the other one with um, giving extra support to certain um, ninth graders. And so Nate and I were talking about it would be nice, you know, not right away, but when they're ready, if they could come up and um, in turn do some of that, some of those same activities with some of our students, some of our older students, you know, and, and it's, it's all boys actually in, in this case at the high school, but um, we talked about that. So there was some really good collaboration that came out of that. Um, we're also doing some wraparound support to all, even on our established families too, be taking like little problems before they become big problems in our, in our conversations around attendance and tardiness. We're starting, once we start to see a pattern, um, you know, whether it's the teacher reaching out, which we prefer first, but sometimes the teacher has had, tried to have some informal conversations and maybe um, it hasn't, you know, made an impact or there might be something else underlying that we need to give more support. So social workers, guidance, myself, we've been reaching out to families saying we're noticing your child's been out, you know, X amount of days already and we're only on the 23rd day of school. Is there something we can do to help support, get your child here? This is if once we've ruled out illness or anything like that. And the same with tardiness. We talk about the importance of that because we know we're also setting the stage for the habits of mind that lead to middle and high school and the importance of the attendance and um, being on time. So, so we've been doing a lot of that as well. Um, for staff, um, we also are doing a fun Friday morning. We were going to do a, um, a 10 minute sort of like little rally every um, Friday morning, like just in the gym. Um, and then <laughs> staff wanted food. Anytime there's anything, there's always food requested. So we're doing a similar thing that the middle school's doing, and it's just kind of an informal, we'll give, you know, staff can give informal accolades to one another, and folks are taking turns. We don't have teams named yet, but we'll, we'll steal that idea from you. Um, we do not have Cake Wednesday. We'll, we might either steal the idea or crash yours, Mike, so um, be, be ready for us. Um, and um, with students themselves, um, we're, we're asking them to help us. We haven't um, done any surveys with them this year yet, but we're asking them to help us. Where are you finding some challenges in terms of location-wise? And it's usually unstructured areas, and we can also, we're also observing, but um, the lunchroom is always a fun dining experience um, as when you come in to have lunch with us. But, we're noticing, again, going back to relationships, the more that we are making, it's not, it's, we've really impressed upon staff, it's not about you know, making that one announcement or two announcements you need to quiet down. It's just really moving constantly up and down. And then at the end, we're noticing they're do, doing a much better job being accountable and cleaning up after themselves. So we, you know, just going by table to table, if you check this, it's not mine, it doesn't have to be yours, it doesn't have to be your strut wrapper, okay, we're all one, we're all help, here to help everyone, and it's working, and so we're starting to notice, but if, on those days when someone has <coughs> done that, you see a big mess. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's a, and we, I really have to give kudos to our allied arts team, they've really taken on the cafeteria kind of as a, a project, like they want to help really problem solve as a team, because they know these students, all of them, across the board. In fact, that morning of Talia's um, surprise, I thought, what are they doing in here? And I was trying to get rid of them in this news cameras around. And they were in there that morning, that's their team meeting morning, and they were down in the cafeteria trying to problem solve that. So. Um, we did review surveys um, as a staff, and they, um, we didn't have a lot of time. We were, we were squeezing it in, um, but we did re um, review the surveys as a staff. And overall, even though overall they were positive, the, the biggest ones were um, not enough time to collaborate, but with our five half early release days now, because they took that survey back in June before we had them. I know they're really grateful for those, and they were very grateful for this past Friday. Um, and Meredith and Ruth Ellen were really flexible in our, our use of the morning. We started out with Tom Chalter. Tom Chalter put a, a survey out on what staff wanted for some technology integration. And um, it was kind of a tie, and um, so he did a, it's called I Can iPad, um, sort of program he's invented to help leverage technology in the most relevant way in different classrooms. That was enormously popular. We did work on pre-assessments to, and really helped um, staff understand the importance of pre-assessments and um, what should be on them, and don't just 
give a pre-assessment and then put it on a shelf and don't look at it again, but really use it to inform your instruction and different, different apps on the iPad that you could use. Um, and then teachers were able to work in teams on the new math edition um, work, and so it, it, went, it went very well. And then with regards to the survey, one of the things that we do want to learn more about is we had some kind of neutral, we had, some, we had a lot of positives, but we also had some neutral areas. And what we don't know, we don't know yet, does, does that neutrality mean there hasn't been an issue, so it wasn't raised, or they just kind of feel passive about it? So we want to just learn a little bit more about that as a staff. So um, I think that's any, any questions about? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I don't have to check it out. It's already checked out. Superintendent's report. OK. Two pages, so I got to work fast. Uh, so yes, Talia Edlund was celebrated last week as the main teacher of the year. And you'll hear more about her role as she sort of settles into that and learns more about her schedule. We will invite her to come back and share some of that with you probably before she goes to the White House, <laughs> in case you have anything you need her to add. To. Thank you. Um, we have enjoyed open houses at all of our schools this year. I want to thank elementary parents in particular for their flexibility. We needed to split that into two evenings for fire safety concerns, and we appreciate staff and parent flexibility with, with those changes. And our fire chief for his support as well. Uh, I did get to chaperone the high school homecoming dance, and it did go very well, and it's always fun to see our young adults sort of dressed up and enjoying some downtime and socializing, and I did speak with a couple of adults there about maybe we need to create a dance card app. Um, so if that takes <laughs> off, you heard it here first. <laughs> I'll point that out. Um, uh, administrators spoke a little bit. You just heard Kelly speak about the workshop day last Friday. Uh, mornings were building focused, and administrators filled you in about that a bit. Our, the afternoon was our first Cape Ed Camp, Ed Camp 1.0. Um, and a couple of our technology staff members, um, Tom Schultray and Jonathan Werner in particular, who um, have attended a number of Ed Camps. Um, took on the role of, sort of coordinating that and getting getting things moving that day. Uh, we've had feedback surveys. I think it's a it's a bold adventure for people who haven't ventured into the world of ed camps in the past because you don't know what the day is going to look like until you get there. And for some of us in education, as Jeff pointed out, some of us are rather tied to. But I want to know what to expect and how it's going to unfold. And so. Um, I would say overall, the feedback was really positive, and there are good learning opportunities for all of us in how to move that work forward. We also had a couple of students, so thank you to um, Emma and uh, Natalie, Sarah Golding. Sorry, not Natalie. Natalie, it's over there. Natalie. Sarah Golding and Emma Shedd for joining us for that day as well. Stu Schmiel is the Dean of Admissions at MIT, and we're still negotiating dates, but he's going to come and do a couple of presentations here, one hopefully for faculty and one for parents, about what they look for in the admissions process. And part of the reason I invited him to come is because one thing I heard him say very articulately is that what they really want is the passion. Um, and they're interested in kids who have pursued their passion and are showcasing that in different ways. So it seemed like he would be a great person to come and we have right. several Cape students who have gone to MIT in the last few years who will also be great ambassadors. Uh, we had five students from the middle school, um, choral students who were selected into the American Choral Directors Association Honors Chorus. They are, I can't even read my writing, that's really sad. That's just really poorly written. Oh, um, <laughs> oh I think I have it. Hard copy, maybe that will help me. Look at that. Okay, they are Bowen Charbois in grade six, Lily Dunton and Jeanette Kelly also in grade six, Emma Frothingham <coughs> in grade seven, and Kim Knopf in grade nine. And so I want to congratulate Nancy Murray, the choral director at the middle school, for her work in encouraging them to audition, and she'll be supporting them through the rehearsal process going into that um, concert in February. Pond Cove will be receiving a 5210 award from the Opportunity Alliance coming up in a couple of weeks. So we want to congratulate them. But that's focused on sort of wellness initiatives and um, healthy activities taking place in our elementary school. Tomorrow is the PSAT at the high school. 
and you've heard, I think, about some of the changes to the redesigned SAT. The SAT, the first sitting, seating of the redesigned SAT is in March, I believe. Jeff is nodding, that's good. Um, but if, what, one of the things that these PSAT students will have access to for the first time is sort of free SAT prep support through Khan Academy, um, through Khan Academy and College Board Partnership. So they'll get the results back and it will point them to do extra practice here. And then they can log into Khan Academy and go online and get free tutorial sessions and practice and uh, immediate feedback on that work. So it's a great opportunity and way to level the playing field for kids um, across the board. So that's pretty exciting. Our two student representatives will be joining the school board's delegate, Barbara Powers, and I believe Kate williams Hewitt is also attending the Maine School Board Association Fall Conference next week, a variety of sessions. The highlight for our students will be that they get to sit with some other students who are attending for about a 45-minute session with astronaut Chris Kelly, so that's very exciting. Next, whatever day the 21st is, next Wednesday is candidate night and that our high school government class sponsors that evening so it's an opportunity for school board and um, town council candidates to, to weigh in but we thank um, the students for putting that together and with some support as always from Ted Jordan. October 22nd next Thursday we'll remind parents is an early release day and there is no school next Friday October 23rd for student um, conferences. Mm, the following Thursday, the 29th of October, um, we'll be leading a, well, I'll be leading a book discussion on a book called The Gift of Failure by Jessica Leahy. Um, essentially, her message is, and this is related to some of Paul Tuff's work um, in How We Succeed and work by people like Angela Duckworth around grit, but the message is that we have to allow children to experience some discomfort and failure and dissatisfaction and frustration in order to help them long-term be successful, resilient, and self-reliant. Look forward to that conversation as a, both a parent and an educator. Um, last week I had a visit um, here from Gorham Superintendent Heather Perry, which is one of the first reciprocal observations that um, she has lined up and that I have lined up with some other folks. Um, but it's a great opportunity to see your district through somebody else's eyes um, and to have some good conversation about the work across the state. Today, happy birthday to you, is the 10th anniversary of the Cape Elizabeth High School Achievement Center. So thank you yes. to Steve and Ginger Raspler and the high school staff who have kept that um, Achievement Center sort of fulfilling the mission that it was created with and supporting students in a variety of ways, including practicing being teachers themselves in, in the role of teaching assistants. The innovation team will meet next Wednesday, or tomorrow. It's already tomorrow, October 14th. I'm getting punchy, it's not good. Um, and in November, their meeting will be held at Texas Instruments. The Wellness Committee will hold its first meeting on the 29th of October. And let's see. There is a, the D, Department of Ed has offered a grant for teacher evaluation work to each district in the amount of $4,600. We anticipate that most of those funds will be spent on bringing back Kim Marshall for a couple nice. of days in December and his work nice. with our administrators as well as some additional professional development needs around assessment literacy. The date for AuthorFest 2016 is April 9th. Is that on your calendars now? I know that we have several big names already on the list, but you'll hear more about that at another time. Uh, I had the opportunity last week to meet with um, several students participating in extended learning opportunities at the high school, um, student playwrights and student videographers, a student who is um, essentially doing a statistical analysis of offensive lines in football and trying to go from, well I don't want to give too much of the secret away because this could be a big money maker for him down the line, but essentially he's breaking out those statistics so that you're not looking at the whole offensive line but really by player on the nice. offensive line and there are very complicated algorithms at play in that work. Um, Maybe but, learn of the students' name. No, but <laughs> it's top secret. Um, 
I expect that some of those students will come before the board, um, most likely in December, to share with you some of their work and awesome. um, the process that they've gone through in developing that work and working together and, and getting resources and support from other places. But um, it's, it's really interesting to hear them describe their work and the value that they place upon being able to have that choice and to have that time built into their school day. That was the thing I heard most from them is like, you're really giving me time during the day to do this. I would want to do this anyway, but I'm so glad I have the time to do it here and now. I also had the opportunity to speak with students who are participating in the Freshman Academy um, class that, again, is a seed-sponsored grant. And what I heard from them, and one of the things that they do as a practice every day is just to have you know two to five quiet minutes at the beginning of class to just focus and think about their day and reflect and um, they didn't realize how helpful that was sort of before they got into that practice and now they can't, many of them voice not being able to imagine not having that as a part of their day. Um, they also appreciated having time during the day to really grapple with some of the issues that they face as adolescents to get some support for handling organizational issues that challenge all of us on a given day. There were adults talking about that at ed camp. You know, how, what are some organizational strategies? Because we're all overwhelmed by the number of things that, that we face in any given day. But it was um, great to hear them speak about their experience and say, boy, this is something everybody should have built into their day. Um, Kelly mentioned collaboration at, um, down the line at the elementary school. I know that there is planned definitive collaboration coming with fifth, some fifth and sixth graders at the middle school in the short term, but I, I think long term they'd move on to the elementary school, or maybe those fifth and sixth graders that they work with will come down and visit students at Pond Cove. Maybe about it. I always forget something really important, but I'm going to stop Wow, there. that's really quite the update. Does anyone have any questions for Meredith? Thank you. Thank you. I really applaud the part of your report, all of it, by the way. There's some fantastic things going on. but. I really applaud the work of you working with other superintendents in other districts to sort of do that cross check of practices. It's, you're only one person, there's many administrators, as many, many teachers to get together. It's, um, I love that you've taken it upon yourself to reach out and, and do that. I will say that as I sent my you know, tweet on Friday that I got an almost immediate response from one of my superintendent colleagues in Wisconsin saying, Yay, we talked about that same idea at our ed camp. And so, you know, it, it's nice to get that sort of feedback. And, you know, as Susan said, you can build a large professional network through Twitter and um, use of other Internet 2.0 tools. So, very nice. Very fun. Thank you. I also want to say that the, there's a theme tonight, it seems like, that keeps getting um, repeated. And I'm so glad to hear it and see it, but starting with the first. Um, with Alina and just a collaboration, you know, whether it's cross-cultural or amongst the schools. It's, it's good to hear it. I feel like I really, I've heard it from so many different people tonight. It's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Item 6B, um, changing in job, job descriptions. May I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the job descriptions listed here, the high school assistant principal and the school department business manager, municipal comptroller. Second. Second. Discussion? These were held out of your packet at the last meeting. Some changes were recommended. We have made those recommended changes. Administrators have had the opportunity to review them, and they are back before you. Do we have any further comments on those changes from the board? All those in favor? Six. Thank you. Item 6C, athletic and co-curricular staff nominations. May I have a motion? Um, sure. I move that we uh, approve the following athletic and co-curricular staff nominations that are put forth in our packet for October 13th, 2015. Second. Second. Discussion? 
There's a lot of people in here. There are a lot, a lot of, or a lot of work represented by these people in here. So in tonight's packet in particular, it's, um, I think it speaks again to the theme that you were talking about earlier, Susanna, that the amount of collaboration across this district. Many of the folks on this list are also classroom teachers during the day, taking on more student extended learning opportunities either during the day or also um, after school and in the evening. So we have a, an incredible cadre of talented and committed teachers and staff to make all this happen. And I would just like to commend all, every single one of these folks who have stepped forward. Yes. I agree, and in addition, I'd just like to point out the, the number of teachers who are taking on mentor roles, which can be just critical as we invite new faculty into this district. So many thanks to them as well. Any other questions, comments? All those in favor? Six. Thank you. Item 6D, school board policies up for approval. May I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the following school board policies presented for second reading uh, as listed in our packet. EHB, JJH, and recommended for deletion, JJB. Second. David? Yes. Discussion? Uh, so it, as I mentioned last month, EHB, it's just a house keeping change in terms of the cross-reference. That's the school records retention policy. Um, in JJH, uh, that's the interrupted study policy. We're just making room here for uh, transcripts, which are broader than grades, but may include um, a different kind of record of the student's experience. Um, and the, the JJB, which is recommended for deletion, that, that um, policy is around schools sponsored social activities or events and that's essentially everything in there is dealt with elsewhere in terms of uh, administrative procedure so does not need to be a school board po level policy in the opinion of the policy committee. Are there any questions, concerns or comments? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Six. Six. Item 6E, school board policies and procedures for the first reading. I don't need a motion, but perhaps the policy chair would like to walk us through. So we're bringing forward uh, for first read um, two policies, JLDBG and KLG-R. Um, the, you have these policies in your packet. Um, and the, 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 I don't think we made substantive changes to these. I think they're just house, these are just housekeeping changes that, are rec that we're recommending. And uh, we spent most of the last policy meeting discussing class size policy. Um, and we will be probably discussing that at our next, we will definitely be discussing that at our next policy meeting. And we may at that point be bringing something forward for first read, but we may not be. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but we had a good discussion around, around class size policy. We reviewed uh, the policies, the class size policies at uh, our comparable districts. Uh, around the state and uh, we learned a thing or two from those policies and we're, we're looking, uh, we're, I, I think I can say that, the, that the, the, the goal of the policy committee is in, in reviewing this policy is to see whether there is a way of constructing a policy that um, more clearly uh, communicates the, the, dis the district's goals in terms of uh, making decisions around class size, um, and so therefore would result in less community anxiety when those decisions are made. Um, but we're not looking, um, you know, this is this, 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 this isn't an effort to change um, our practice around class sizes. 
Thank you. Um, I, if no one else has a question, I have a question for John. Sure. Um, Two-part question. One is if there are any recommendations for any from anyone in the community <laughs> on the first reads, um, when would those be due by? And secondly, um, and this is just an assumption statement, but I'm assuming that the uh, materials for your class size discussions are in your online in the meeting packet. Should anyone care to review? In, in That's right. They're they were prior. They're in our meeting materials for our the prior policy committee meeting, which was the third Monday in September, if I recall, which will be the date of our next policy meeting, which would be the time by which we need any input on, on that read. policy or the first read policies. And we have had some public input on on uh, on the class size policy. You have this coming Monday the 19th. We, we requested, uh, I think we're getting some recommendations from administrators. We, we came up with some general ideas. Uh, we wanted him to flesh out what they thought would be the appropriate way to structure class size policies, what the recommendations would be and why. And that's what we're waiting on for. I assume we're going to get it sometime before our policy meeting. There it is. You know? Yes, okay. you are. The administrators are finalizing some recommendations on Friday. Um, I think this is for, I have a question for you, I think, Meredith. If teachers um, want to weigh in on this, should they go straight to their administrator or do they go straight to the policy, to John, with um, information? Because... I would say typically they would go to their administrators. Yep. And they, um, it's posted and so um, staff members do know that there's policies being looked at as, as, and especially the enrollment is looked at every few years over and over. And so if there's any comments that they can bring it to their administrators. They certainly can remind. Thank you. Are there any other questions or concerns or comments for item 6E? Okay, since no vote is necessary, we'll move on to item 6F. May I have a motion in regards to the lease purchase agreement for one school bus? Yes, I move that we authorize a $92,389 lease purchase agreement for one school bus. I assume the agreement is in our packet. And that we don't have to read it. You guys <laughs> made me read it? You just do that one. You were new. <laughs> yes. I was so excited to make you read this. Okay. So I, don't, I don't think it is. Need to read the whole thing summary. Like yes. Night on school one. I think the memo is in your packet. Oh, the entire thing. I've been from the business administrator. Who said do that? Shut down. I read this entire. Very impressed. Thank you. Very impressed. Yeah. Thank you. Very impressed. She, and it was like her first night at school board. It was like brand new. It's immediately after the policies and. I can't tell you how far that is from the back. It was in my packet, David. I'm, it's covered. It actually says memorandum. It's not, it's it's not a memo. an agreement. It's a summary of what it is. With the that's it's correct. It's a, it's a summary of what the terms are of the lease yeah. agreement and the motion that's authorizing us to enter yeah. into the lease, and then I sign it on behalf of the board. Right. <laughs> Nobody has to read the lease agreement. It's not in here. That's correct. So, do we have a section? Yeah. I second. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, Meredith, would you like to give us a lowdown on need or Sorry, background was, or history? Sorry, I was doing that prior to the second, so I apologize. That's but quite all right. We typically replace a bus every year. As part of, we budget for those during the budget process, so we did budget for the replacement of a bus and budgeted for the lease payment. Um, we don't enter into the lease until we take receipt of the bus. So you are authorizing us to enter into a lease agreement. Um, again, we're projecting interest rates somewhere between 2.24 and 2.32%. And um, we expect to take delivery of the bus in sometime in the next three weeks or so. Yes. We were promised an end of October delivery date, but that doesn't always happen. Um, but we anticipate that we'll receive the bus in the next few weeks. And again, essentially, this provides us the authority to enter into that agreement. David. Um, 
just to note the memo, we, we, we did submit a uh, request for proposals from about four institutions. We got three. The business manager recommended one with the lowest interest rate, which seems to me self-evident, uh, assuming that all the other terms are the same. And I, I would suggest we approve it, but obviously pick the one with the lowest interest rate, assuming all the terms are the same. That is the recommendation of the business administration. And again, this was already approved in the FY16 budget for these terms. Any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor? Six. Six. On to item 6G. I uh, move, also move that we approve the collective bargaining agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Education Admini Educational Administrators Association dated July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2017. Um, so we're excited to bring this forward. Um, we have, as John and I, um, have recommended to the full board that we move to um, approve our tentative agreement um, with the Cape Elizabeth Education Administrators Association very excited to be able to finalize this very important work. Likewise. Thank you. Questions, comments, concerns? Thank you all for doing the work. It's, um, I think, a labor of love. Hard work. Okay. Um, seeing no further discussion or questions, all those in favor? Thank you. Item 6H. <clears throat> May I have a motion in regards to the board representative to the elementary assistant principal interview committee? Sure. I move that we appoint a board, a board representative. Oh, I represent, uh, uh, I move that we appoint Susanna Mazil Pubs. That's how they do. That's great. Um, to, uh, as a Representative to the Elementary Assistant Principal into, uh, Interview Committee. Second. Okay. Um, thank you, Susanna, for stepping up to this um, important role. May the work move on smoothly. May, what's the saying? The road rise, rise, rise up to you, you too, and the wind be at your back. <laughs> thank you. An exciting, an exciting time. Um, are there any questions, concerns, or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? So page. Item seven, committee reports. So I can just note briefly that buildings and grounds met. Um, as we mentioned to you at the last board meeting, we were reviewing the report regarding the pool. Um, it is the feeling of that committee that we will need to move to take action and replace um, the heating equipment at the pool, but we are reviewing some potential ways to do that and financing options that we'll come back to you with further information. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that yeah, Potentially at the cheap. finance meeting at the end of October, if that's our hope. Quick. Okay. Um, I feel like we've been given the lowdown on the policy committee. Are there other teacher evaluations? <coughs> teacher Oh, go ahead. Uh, this isn't a committee, but I don't know when else to ask it. As your delegate next week at the MSA conference, um, I'm wondering your protocol for me to know how to best represent you at the delegate conference. Meredith sent us in our packet the four resolutions that will be before us, which all sound <coughs> logical and appropriate to me, but I'm representing this body. So I wondered if anyone had any objections to any of the resolutions. They are. Um, they have to do with vouchers and educational savings accounts, which in shorthand means um, parents being able to opt to use public funds to attend private schools, both parochial and, and um, secular. Uh, standardized tensing, testing benchmarks, which simply encourages the Department of Education to take their time in choosing the next vendor, so we really choose wisely and won't be going off in 12 different directions in the next 12 years, so it's just sort of a recommendation to take care. 
The third one is spending additional general purpose aid, which might be near and dear to our hearts. That would mean that once a budget validation referendum occurs and the legislature in its wisdom approves monies later that actually adds money to general purpose aid coming our direction, that we could in fact incorporate that into our budget versus having to stop at the point where the budget validation landed. And the fourth is teacher retirement funding and being more transparent about the protocol that the legislature used to decide how much more is going to land on us, which was a surprise this past year. So um, I'm, I'm very comfortable with where those are, but I really appreciate making sure that all of you are. There, I know this is the same conversation we have had the past couple of years with David asking the same question. Well, yeah, I think in fairness, we should authorize you to vote in favor of those resolutions on our behalf. And Pat and I would like to make a motion in to give you reasonable discretion to the extent that there's you know, amendments that you think are appropriately fulfill the goals of that to allow you to vote for them as well. Okay. So I would move that we authorize uh, our representatives to vote in favor of the four proposed resolutions attached to our packet, plus authorized to uh, vote in favor of any <coughs> amendments uh, thereto that uh, are consistent with the spirit of the language summarizing the uh, resolutions we've seen. Okay. Thank you. So the first part of that but would then be, does everyone agree to support? Well, if I make a motion, then we can all discuss it. So I just made a motion. I second it. Okay, discussion. So does everyone agree? I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I would just say one could argue that by appointing Barbara as the delegate, you may have already given her that blessing, but that's the board's decision. Normally, I would advise against taking action on an item that's not specifically on your agenda. The resolutions were included in your packet, and so I just provide that information. I, I think there's something we can do, because this is something we normally do in private. We've now put it forth in public meeting. We're voting on it in public meetings. Notice was given by being included in the packet. Well, I also heard Barbara ask in a less formal way our opinion yeah. and, and our, our advice right. on how to proceed. <laughs> and I do believe that we have already given Barbara the power to take action. Well, I, since it's my last meeting, I don't really care, but we haven't given a power unless we vote on it. And that's just the function of reality. <clears throat> because, I mean, I wasn't willing to do it without being authorized. And you only get authorized by motion and approval of the majority of the board. So, what Barbara feels comfortable with. Well, that's why I brought it up. And, and in the spirit of the consensus I'm hearing, I'm happy to go forward either way. Fantastic. I will use my best judgment with the amendments. So we still have a motion on the table from David that's been seconded. Um, I'm hearing Meredith in the Robert's Rules of Order not being able to, it's not a specific item on the agenda that's been called out, although it was included in our packet, so not that's correct. Sure. It doesn't preclude you from adding new business. I would just say that it, it, my recommendation to a uh, board in general is that you want to give the public full notice. I, I appreciate David's point that he believes that including it in the packet is full notice um, before you take action on an item that isn't posted on your agenda. Uh, that said, do I expect that there's going to be a huge level of controversy around this particular decision? I do not. Um, it's, it's just about your practices generally and being mindful of that. And I can just to belabor it for the last few minutes I'm here. If we're authorized to do it, we're taking action. So whether we do it or not, either we violated the law or we didn't, we didn't, and we might as well vote to do it properly. But, so we have a motion in front of us. Okay. All those in favor to support Barbara's power to vote in the uh, affirmative on these four resolutions? Good. Any other committee reports? Teacher evaluation is um, moved on to the next step. 
um, with a lot of hard work from a lot of 11 staff members and hard work of um, Sarah Harrington and Meredith for co-chairing a year and a half. Um, every month, if not twice a month, two hour, three hour meetings um, with a lot of homework involved. Um, the committee is now uh, dissolved. Is dissolved and we've moved on to a steering committee. And so this is a pilot year for the school um, principals and teacher, and including, uh, we're including not secretary, uh, tell me, just teachers and principals are the two um, groups that are doing a pilot year, and it's very exciting. Yes, and I can just add that the steering committee has met yeah. and um, has elected a co-chairs. Uh, Marguerite lawler Roner from the middle school and Beth Milroy from the high school are co-chairing nice. that committee moving forward. Nice. Um, the pilot trainings are scheduled for the 19th and 26th at the different schools. Or, sorry, not the training, the orientation. Um, a big portion of the training occurred before the start of school. And then there will be a dine and discuss for people participating in the pilot on the 12th of November and there will be some additional pieces scheduled as the year moves along. <laughs> Well, are there any other committee reports? Questions on the evaluation process? Steering committee? Okay. Um, school board agenda requests. <coughs> we can have them <coughs> officially um, taken here tonight, or um, both Meredith and I are willing to field those requests at least a week before our last meeting, next meeting, which is in a month. So. I apologize for not adding that as an agenda. I, I just wasn't sure your protocol going forward with delegates. So next year. We checked oh. last year. Yes. Okay. Because it did come up. Okay. No problem. Um, okay. Announcements of upcoming meetings. Policy meets on Monday, uh, this upcoming Monday at 7.30 a.m. Innovation meets tomorrow, and wellness meets Thursday the 29th at 3.30 p.m. Innovation's at 3 or 3.30? 3.30. Are there any upcoming meetings for the Cape Elizabeth Services Advisory Committee? I'm not sure, but I know that we need to appoint two new members. We have oh. two openings. Thank That's you right. for reminding That's me right. of that. Uh, they meet Wednesdays, and we have a joint meeting with them scheduled in December or January. I'm not going to be able to pull it up quickly enough on my device. But. So if we have <clears throat> any members of the public who are dying to serve, um, we need you for the Cape Elizabeth Services Advisory Committee. We need two people. The, um, the Advisory Committee meets roughly about once a month to discuss <clears throat> budgets and programmatic issues in regards to the Cape Elizabeth Community Services Advisory Services. Um, David has served as a delegate, and I have two this from the board. It's really an interesting work as far as um, discussions about how best we can serve our community through that organization. Um, we need recommendations at least a week prior to our next meeting so that we can appoint them to the board. Yes, so interested. Folks can send their names along to either you or to me or to our office, um, and either to my attention or to the attention of Andrea Fuller, who works in our office. When will this be voted on, the new people to be on? So they take office in January, so yeah. typically December, the December meeting. Okay, because I, I already told them I would probably, since I'm no longer going to be the school board representative, I would volunteer to, to do it. So I'll probably send my name. I want to make sure it's while I was off the board. So. Yes, it would be. Fantastic. Are there any up other upcoming meetings that we need to make sure we have on our radar? Well, with that said, I have checked off everything on my agenda. Seven, eight, nine. Oh, wait, except ten. <laughs> we have a motion. I make a move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Six. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
You look forward to that so we don't have